Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I'm delighted to have as a return guest, Alan Sang from Oblinger and Sang, and also a co-founder of the Negotiation Tribe. Alan, welcome. Hi, Marcus. Nice to be here again. So it's a pleasure. <laughs> it feels like it was only yesterday. So today, we're going to talk about something that people really generally misunderstand. Uh, which is narrative. Uh, what I'd like you to do, if you would, is describe the difference between story and narrative and why the difference is important. Narratives are important because that is what drives people to take action for good or bad, for themselves or for others. Stories throughout history has been the way that generations have taught the next the, the young, uh, younger kids, right? Uh, they're oral stories. Stories are a series of fact or events that is threaded together. It's got a chronological order. It's got a timeline. It's got characters in it. Narratives occur when someone interprets that story from their perspective. They're now a player within it. They have individual narratives, and then you have collective narratives. Look, there are courses on it, and I'm not going to summarize a whole graduate course on narrative on in one hour. So, we, so we'll just talk a little bit about, from a negotiation point of view, how do narratives influence how we negotiate? So the, the importance of narrative is you can have two people experiencing or listen to a story and they will interpret it differently. They're going to pick out different facts from within the story to support their own narrative. Understood. So where people are coming from determines the narrative, their interpretation of a particular story or event. Their, yes, their experiences, their feeling, even their emotions, and their circumstances would influence how they see a story. I can, you can listen to a story and an Easterner and a Westerner would interpret the story differently. Interesting. Okay. So in terms of negotiation, what advice would you give to people who are negotiating with somebody in terms of doing their research about the individual that they are negotiating with in order to ensure that you understand how they are likely to respond to a story because of their narrative. So we're going we're gonna to begin with the end in mind here. We're actually wrapping up the, the podcast and starting it here. So in the negotiation, <laughs> a lot of times people would try to do discovery and listen for a story. They should instead listen for the narrative. How does the person see the story from their perspective? How does it influence how they feel about it? Or how did they feel when they were experiencing the events? What do they okay. find? What do they find important within that story? They're gonna pick certain facts out, and usually they impose they, they superimpose values and morals into that story. That's really interesting. Okay. If you're selling to somebody it's important to have them tell their story, to paint the picture as they see it. And if you're then listening out for the narrative, rather than paying attention to the story, you're going to identify what their values are, mm -hmm. uh, what their priorities are, mm -hmm. and how they perceive how they got to that moment. Correct. Very An powerful. example would be like this. I'll give you a very short example, and then uh, we'll, I'll share some more stories later. So um, there was an account manager trying to sell into a company, and this procurement person would not allow this long-standing relationship increase their price by 4% that year. And he did a lot of discovery, and he couldn't get, get, get the point across that he needs to increase price by 4%. The procurement person said, no. We cannot raise 4% this year at all. We can't do it. So he came to me and we chatted and I said, go find out what, uh, what's her story. What's her story? Not the company's story. The company says no 4%. When we got into her story, she goes, well, I'll tell you what, 
this year, I have metrics imposed on me to keep my costs down. And if I can keep my costs down, I get certain bonuses. He said, and so she said, if you would allow me not to, if you would allow us not to increase price on this batch of work, I can take work from another supplier and give that to you. Okay. People buy for their reasons, not your reasons. Exactly. And, and if even you within, don't understand. Yes. Sorry, and even on. within the company, the procurement person has her own agenda that may not even have aligned with the company's agenda. I have two examples of this. One, my friend Paul uh, was training a large IT company, and one of the salespeople received an RFP, and they weren't going to bid because it was in Germany with a German company who was using a German software provider for everything. Uh, anyway, long story short, the salesperson put it in at full fees, full price list. And uh, a week later, he received uh, the order. He'd left the company about six months later and started working for another company. And he met the CTO uh, who had moved. And it turned out the reason he did it was he wanted uh, their brand on his CV. And he was ready to move. He'd been at the company a few years and uh, had decided that he was going to issue it to them no matter what. And that was 3 million euros. Now, mm -hmm. another example of this, uh, my pal Nick Ayton took out the CEO of one of their prospects. They were trying to do a big outsourcing deal. And it transpired that actually the driver behind the CEO's decision was him being able to exercise his options. So what he needed to have was a management consultancy project that proved that he uh, had done a great job and he could go out on a high. And not only did they win the management consulting piece, but they also won the outsourcing deal that they were originally going for because they found that they found the individual human. It's a bit like poker. Uh, you play the man, not the hand. So tell me this then, what are the clues that one should look for to filter out the narrative from the story and to keep your own narrative out of the way, because my suspicion is it's very easy to filter rather than uh, seeing things as they are. You might see things as you would like them to be. That's a great question. If you listen to someone tell a story versus them telling their narrative, their narrative would have a lot more of, I did this, this happened to me, this was done to me. So they would see themselves as one of the, the players, as a hero or as a villain. Or in, um, in, the, in The Power of Ted, uh, there's a book by uh, David Emerald, is The Power of Ted, The Empowerment Dynamic. And uh, you, you, I think you, we've talked about this, like the drama triangle and their empowerment dynamic. And you, you have someone that would uh, see themselves as a rescuer someone being painted as a persecutor and someone identifying themselves as a victim. Okay. Yeah. So when they start taking uh, like a prominent role or things that were happened, happened, that happened to them and that was out of their control, they have now put themselves into it and they have a, a narrative. And when a person has a narrative that is reinforced over and over again, it can have positive or negative impact on their behavior. Just like even in a, in a, in a community, right? If you have a, a, a group of people within a community, let's call them a subgroup, and they experience negative actions from a majority group, they start to tell themselves a story and they start weaving for themselves a narrative. And we call this a collective narrative. And that's when you have rebellion or you have civil war. People act on that. And within it, they have values. Usually, I was unfairly treated. I was abused. I was bullied, right? So there's all these different narratives that people would tell. And within it, you hear a lot of their story, like me, I, done to me. And then there's value. There's values imposed into it. Moral. Interesting. Okay. So 
one of the uh, fundamental lessons that I've learned over the years is ego thrives on drama. So the moment you see or hear anybody taking up the position of victim, persecutor, or rescuer, that's their ego being hooked. And one critically important bit of advice is to not get sucked into that psychological game. The problem is the moment someone takes the position of victim, they're normally moving into the position of persecutor shortly afterwards. And they then turn it on you. And it's so important that you prevent yourself from getting sucked in. That is so true. That reminds me of a story. It's a tragic story. Tragic story. A person who saw himself as a victim turned himself into a persecutor. He at first reached out to someone that he wanted to, uh, to pull into his world as a rescuer. And then later, he saw the rescuer as a persecutor. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. People um, who are caught up in the drama triangle swap positions. In fact, you, often you don't even need someone else because you can play all three positions yourself if you're stupid enough to. I remember um, a few years ago, my wife Suzanne suggested um, that uh, she was going to redecorate the living room. And DIY in my household stands for don't involve yourself. So I kissed her goodnight, went to sleep, and it was Saturday morning and she was down there. And I was quite happily watching the cookery programs and snoozing. And 11.26, I thought, oh, I wonder if she needs help. Classic re rescuer response. She didn't ask for my help. Anyway, so I went downstairs and I said, do you need help? Victim voice. And she said, only if you want to. So I read that as, do you better bloody well do it? So off I went to the garage, got my bucket and brushes, uh, came back and I was pulling wallpaper off with a thundercloud and rainstorm and uh, you know, <laughs> snow over my head. And after about eight or nine minutes, she leans across and says, Marcus, are you okay? You don't seem fully engaged in this. And says, well, victim, but you know, I had a hard week. <laughs> anyway, long story <laughs> short, she said, I know you've had a hard week. I've hardly seen you. And I thought it would be nice if we did something together. When I said only if you want to, I meant only if you want to. And I'd managed to play all three positions without involving her. Sorry, Suzanne. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. You guys are going to have an interesting pillow talk tonight after she yeah. listens to this. She's like, what do you mean? <laughs> no, no, no. She remembers that. I've used this story many times uh, to illustrate my stupidity and the point. What's really important is to understand the antidote to the drama triangle, the antidote to letting your narrative color your judgment of the other person is the winner's triangle. Instead of being a victim, you're vulnerable. Instead of being a persecutor, you're assertive. And instead of being a rescuer, you're nurturing and empathic. And the beauty of that is that you can be fully present. The problem with the drama triangle is it drags you into the past or causes you to worry about the future. And one of my favorite quotes from David Sandler is, worry is interest paid in advance on borrowed trouble. And I, I think far too often, one's attachment to an outcome, attachment to being perceived in a particular way, in the procurement lady's case, the attachment to her bonus meant that it gave leverage to the salesperson when they finally worked it out. And the smart money stays in the winner's triangle, but it's very difficult to let go of attachment. So talk to me about the whole concept of attachment in negotiation and why it represents an Achilles heel for the negotiator who has it. Let me understand a little bit of what you mean by attachment. Attachment means that you want something to happen in a particular way. You want a specific result. You want to win this deal so you keep your job. You want to win this deal because you want the commission. You have a particular view of your place in the world, and someone else is uh, you know, spoiling that. Um, okay. So you then put them into the position in your mind of persecutor. Gotcha. Well, uh, in that case, attachment is incredibly dangerous because it's a, it's, it sounds like th these are outcomes that you have no control over. Mm. And it prevents you from being in the moment and truly listening deeply and doing great discovery, deep discovery into the world of your counterpart. 
so again, I can't stress enough how important what Alan has just said is. If you are fully present, then you will be operating from that winner's triangle, from a position of objectivity and authenticity. The moment you are sucked into a place of attachment, and in fact, the Buddha said it better than me, attachment is the root to all misery. Then what happens is you start replaying old past hurts and you drag those feelings into the present and you superimpose them on the, uh, in the moment. And then you start making judgments and that's where prejudice comes in, pre-judgment. And this is where you start entering into the world of blame, excuses, avoidance, and you facilitate conflict. And it's not constructive, it's the destructive type. So let's talk a little bit about the power of constructive conflict and why that is an important skill to develop in the context of negotiation. Constructive conflict. Well. By the time we get to a conflict, there's already, that's what it is, a conflict, right? So a constructive dialogue with people of different ideas or perspective would be how I would look at it. So it's important for us to be able to have difficult conversations with people that have different ideas and perspective to avoid escalating to the point where there's conflict. Once we get to a conflict, we want to de-escalate that in order to go back to having that difficult conversation where our perspectives are different. So it's almost cyclical. It's cyclical. And if you look at it as a spiral, and as it spirals up, we, go to, we move towards agreement. And on the bottom, we have opposing ideas or opposite ideas, or perhaps we even have the same ideas, but we're expressing it differently. And therefore, we view the other person as having an opposing idea, but sometimes after people talk through what they really see or how they see things, and Marcus, you may come across that as well, they go, oh, we actually see things the same way. Often you are in violent agreement, but you're misinterpreting because of that narrative and history, and also mismatched expectations, I think the mother of all fuck-ups, you know, the mother of disappointment, of mismatched expectations is ambiguity. And one of the things that I really love about the work you and Dan are doing is that whole concept of mission and purpose. Mm -hmm. And would you mind just ex uh, defining what you guys mean by that? Mission and purpose are two different things, but we, we kind of lump them together. In a negotiation, the mission is the overall goal, the long-term aim, what the other party wants to achieve, what are they setting out to uh, accomplish, right? The purpose is event-based, and each event drives and moves the efforts towards their long-term mission. It's almost like purpose is the story, whereas event is the narrative. Oh, uh, you mean the mission is the narrative? Uh, sorry, uh, mission is the narrative, yeah. Yes, similar. I would say the narrative is the mission, what they really want. Yeah. And then each event is a subplot. Okay, got it. We're going to move the subplot a little bit along until the whole narrative is told from their world, from their perspective, never from you as the seller's perspective. They don't really care about Absolutely. why you went into business. And, and, and people sell that a lot. They only care about how are, they gonna, how are you going to help them move their company and their efforts towards their long-term aim? Well, again, this is where I think sales has gone so off the rails because at the heart of everything that we do, we need to keep in mind that the customer is only interested in their delivering on their outcomes for them to be successful. They don't care that you want to go on the President's Club holiday to Barbados. Uh, they don't care that you've got a, a quota to pay. <laughs> uh, I have had a salesperson tell me this, Marcus. You're going to get a kick out of it. I went to buy a car, and the car salesman goes, 
I am so close to winning this uh, trip to to Caribbean. This is pre COVID, and in my mind, you know what I'm thinking? Leverage. Oh, yeah, I don't care. And now that I know you need to do it, then okay, that's going to mean a lot to you. To the point, Marcus, he's willing to lose money on selling the car. Yeah, because it's not his money. That's the other thing. But I think a really important theme that I'm driving home is this concept of buyer safety. I fundamentally believe sales has lost its way because of the way sales is now driven towards quarterly quota attainment, um, being very transactional. And our job uh, is to help our customers achieve their outcomes. That's why sales exists. It's a service profession. And if you don't have that concept of buyer safety front and center, then they cannot trust you because your selfish self-interest is being served before theirs. And if you're not ready to surrender the outcome in order to achieve the outcome that they need, even though you may be coming at it from different positions and knowing that when you start out, you will not have reached agreement, ultimately, your success is dependent on helping them deliver their success. So one of the conversations you and I have had many times is about creating a steady stream of strong and sustainable little agreement after little agreement after little agreement, and being willing to engage in challenging conversations without being disrespectful, but recognizing that you are the expert in your field, um, and it is your responsibility to make sure that your customer is safe from making a bad decision. If it's not right for you, or it's not right for them, all you're going to do is create a problem for yourself down the road. And there are times when it does make sense to walk away from uh, the wrong type of business. If you cannot find consensus that both sides can live with eventually, then you have no business selling them. Absolutely. I mean, even Dan, Dan and I, there are some cases, it's very rare, very, very rare, but it does happen that there are some students that we have to invite for them to leave the program. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is an ideal student. Not everyone is an ideal client. Sometimes you have to invite them to just walk away or leave the program. You give them the right, we give them the right to say no to us. Fair um, enough. I think it's important to do that because that lowers resistance and it eliminates the threat because no one wants to be strong-armed into the wrong decision. And no one buys products or services, makes investments, because they uh, want to deliver lower value. No one comes to you because they want to make a poor business decision that has lasting ramifications for themselves and the company. So it's your responsibility to be a fantastically astute listener and listen for what's not being said often as much as what is being said and listen for the nuance. And I think this is where sales has gone wrong as well, because so many sellers are under pressure to try and get the deal in this month, no matter what. And that, I think, is an abuse of the position. Your thoughts? Yeah, we're talking about that winner's triangle, drama triangle, the whole mindset that is destructive, right? With your permission, I'd like to circle back to narrative and story because that's yes, the uh, podcast, right? And I want to share a tragic story I think your audience may like because I see this played out in many different companies. And this falls right into that drama triangle that we talked about. So picture this. Picture this guy. Um, we're going to call him Joe. This is a, I'm going to call this a fictional story. Okay. The fictional story, and even it resembles any actual story, it is purely coincidental. <laughs> okay. So there's Joe. Joe works at a company. He's been there for 20 years. Picture this. Great engineer. Worked in the company for 20 years. He's doing sales. Sales engineer. He's account manager. And uh, he did well. He grew some accounts. And over time, his accounts got bigger and bigger. But then close to 20 years, things change. Business change. Just in the last 10 years, the way people sell has already changed. Marcus, you've seen that. Absolutely. 
Problems start creeping into his account. Customers are unhappy. His boss had to bring in help to help him. He's had multiple sales managers and a COO trying to help him. Some of his accounts basically did not want him on their accounts anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they had to be reset with another account manager. Basically, they said, either we're going to leave you and find another uh, supplier, or you, we're going to frustrate you till you fire us. So they had to be reset, or they were going to be lost altogether. The boss felt he has been there for a long time, and for that reason, for his loyalty, he wanted to keep him until he retired from there. He was close to retirement. But then because some of his accounts were lost, he had a salary decrease. And then COVID made it worse. But things were not working out for him because he didn't save enough money for retirement. So he wanted a salary increase. He asked for an increase. His boss says no. So he sent, in, he sent a, resign, a resignation letter. The boss accepts the resignation letter, starts to hire a replacement, and he goes, well, I didn't mean that. I didn't, I didn't want to resign. I want my job back. Well, too late. So guess what he does? He sues. He files a lawsuit for age discrimination. The problem with that is half the company is people that are about to retire. His boss has no problem working with uh, old people. Like they are just, it's, just a, it's just how it was. So ultimately, he failed, and he lost. He lost everything. So this is his narrative. His narrative is, I've been loyal. I'm very knowledgeable. I grew my accounts. My customers love me. The difficult ones are just difficult. They're just, they just don't like me because they're just bad people. They don't understand me. The managers were just getting in his way of doing a great job. And he had his way of doing things, and they worked fine at one time, 18 years ago. He felt his salary was being taken in order to hire younger people. So he felt mistreated. This is his narrative. Yeah. So guess what he used? This boss was told by many managers to let this guy go. The boss rescued him and stood behind him and allowed his bad behavior to continue. Because loyalty was important to his boss. Yep. So later, he looked at this boss who was once a rescuer into the persecutor now. Yep. He was the victim, and therefore he sued them, and he became the persecutor. This dynamic is played over and over and over again. You see this happen all the time because rescuers... The definition of a rescuer is someone who helps without boundaries or permission. And they tend to be mollycoddling and permissive, and they let things ride. Now, the problem with being a rescuing manager, or the problems with being a rescuing manager, one, you end up having to put out fires all the time. That tends to mean you suffer from a lot of upward delegation. Two, you send a message to the rest of the organization that this kind of behavior will be tolerated. And people who are good employees resent it. And that can lead to staff turnover uh, because people get really irritated with it and they just say, to hell with this, I'm off. What it can also do is it can uh, build walls and create silos. And a rescuing manager, actually, I think is the most divisive of all. They're worse than a persecuting manager. Because a persecuting manager, you know where you stand. And generally what a persecuting manager does is uh, drive down the standard of performance and people do the minimum necessary not to be noticed. Whereas a rescuing manager will come along and help without your permission. So they will redo your work. And that creates a diminishment at a level of identity. But it also causes you to say, well, there's no point in me doing this. And that then becomes a pervasive part of the culture. And you have to be really careful. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important when you're recruiting to look for examples of how managers deal with conflict and uh, difficult employees and difficult people, how salespeople deal with conflict and difficult customers. Because very often, I mean, I had a, a, an example a while ago where someone asked me if, I knew of anyone who was recruiting. 
And I asked why, and they came back and they said that they're looking. And my response back was, tell me, why aren't you a better salesman? And he said, well, why do you ask? And I said, well, generally, people who think they're the finished article, basically assholes, they, if you think you're the finished article, you probably have a sense of, or uh, you'll have a sense of entitlement. And my intent wasn't to offend him. It was simply to state my position. He came back all offended. But actually, it did exactly what the, uh, the question was intended to do, which is to flush out how someone responds, because his response wasn't to look deeper. His response was to take it as a personal affront. Mm -hmm. Now, I apologize. I haven't heard back. I don't suppose I will. But the door is open if he wants to come back. But what I want to establish early on is does someone in a negotiation or a sales or a management role get to the truth? Do they understand the motive, cause, and intent? And in negotiation, if you don't understand the motive behind your counterpart's behavior or why they've requested or entered into an RFP, if you don't understand the cause that got them there and you don't understand the intent in terms of the outcome, then effectively what you will probably do is turn up and vomit a lot of product information at them. And then you end up in a situation where basically either they buy or don't buy. It's not because of anything that you've done and you'll inevitably be stiffed on price. Exactly. You mentioned something that uh, I wanted to point out a little bit. And sometimes you can say something and I recently put a post on LinkedIn and you made it. You made a. You made a comment, or you made an observation, and someone took it as a, a personal affront to probably their identity, their their behavior, whatever. You may not have that intention, and I think that is a very detrimental behavior for salespeople to have. And one of the things that Dan and I train into our students is curiosity. Whenever you feel that you've been offended, is to go straight into curiosity mode. Whereas a lot of people will fall into the narrative trap. Well, someone in the past said this or did this. And therefore, Marcus saying this is also insulting me or being rude to me or being too aggressive or being too assertive or being too whatever. Direct. And therefore, <laughs> they feel good. They, they want to take offense to it because by being a victim, the immediate feeling of a victim is actually... It feels good because there is a type of vindication. See, yeah. Marcus is a bad guy. Look at, he has hurt my feelings. Absolutely. Right? So you are just one of the bad guys out there and I have recognized you as a bad guy. What has happened is if they're not driven by a valid mission and purpose, they are going to lose that relationship with you and lose the help that you could offer them. And it's the only person that loses in the long term is the person that that uh, that took something personal, and they act on that narrative. They never they never went, Marcus. What exactly when you said that? What exactly did you mean? Exactly, and uh, again, I, I've fallen victim of it. And part uh, again, there's a there's a lesson to be learned here, um, which is whenever you are starting to feel offended or slighted in any way, do not resort to uh, writing. Email has lost me more good relationships than anything else. Pick up the phone. Ask to have a conversation with them before you fall into misinterpretation. Because the problem with the written word is it's understood in the voice that it's read in. It's not understood in the voice that it was written in. Mm -hmm. And you do not have the immediate feedback loop. So if you are ever in a conflict situation and you're spotting that someone else's narrative may not be going in the direction that you need it to, then do everything you can to prevent the conversation descending into email. I have two comments about that. Number one, I have a lot of emails in draft form Really long. <laughs> that have never been sent. <laughs> <laughs> Don't press send. <laughs> Just, in fact, uh, I have a Google, on uh, my Gmail, I have a feature that says you can undo it. And I have used the undo just to recall an email just in time before the 30 seconds were up. Right. The other thing is, it also depends on the person, Marcus, because 
knowing you and having sp- spoken to you a few times and being on your podcast, I consider you as a friend and Love I that. like your style. You're very direct. So I don't have to guess where, where things stand between you and me, right? Yeah. And sometimes in a written format, they become maybe to some people too direct or maybe maybe aggressive or too assertive. I've been, I've been accused of being too assertive. I can't believe that. <laughs> Dan finds that funny. <laughs> so, but some people are actually worse off when they speak. And you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they, they are probably better at writing mm. a letter. And so I think it depends. Sometimes some people are so abrasive when they talk, they actually escalate the conflict, even though they didn't mean it. I think you're, that's very fair and very right. What I would say is that this is an object lesson in why rehearsal and preparation is so key. That's exactly right. So you have to prepare. You have to think it out. Before you send a letter or before you even call the person, you have to get your, your mindset right. You have to make sure your intention is right. That way your tone, when you, when you speak to that person, has a different tone to it. And that's what you want. You don't have tone in email. But if your tone is rude, when you're speaking to the person, it can make it worse. And this is why the uh, winner's triangle model is a fabulous baseline. Remember, vulnerable, that means you put yourself in a position where you may be hurt or wounded, and you do it anyway. It is an act of courage. It's where you take ownership. It's where you take responsibility. It's where you express genuine, sincere sorrow, regret, for having caused any offense. Assertive means that you clearly draw boundary or line without being aggressive or rude or intentionally offensive or insulting. And nurturing and empathic means that you are keep their identity intact and you don't diminish them in any way, shape or form. I um, love that. It takes enormous discipline to operate from that space. Because in this day and age, we want to do instant response. We're hoping for an instant reply. We want to win. And you've got to be very careful about the whole concept of winning. You might win the battle, but lose the war. And that, again, you know, it's, it is known as a Pyrrhic victory. King Pyrrhus beat the Persians. Then uh, he had uh, one battle, but depleted himself so badly that all they had to do was just turn up. Uh, and walk all over him. So you've got to be really very, very careful, and you've got to play the long game. And that's something that I'm really very conscious is, has been missed in the last 20, 30 years in sales. People are so fixated on this quarter, on getting this deal, that they're not thinking long term. And when we prospect in my companies, we prospect for a customer who will be a customer in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And I want to send, sell to their children and their grandchildren too. Um, I don't want to spend my time going out and starting my business afresh every month. That's just dumb. We, we have very similar uh, 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 philosophies. And that's why uh, you, you see me write a lot about we help people build long-term agreements that doesn't fall apart easily. You can always lie to someone, cheat someone, and have a short-term win. And that's why in negotiation, Dan and I are so allergic to other negotiator trainers that say, I will help you win. Just think about it for a minute. If you are someone that is trained by a negotiator that helps you win, and I know about it, why would I want to negotiate with you? Because I want to lose? Yeah. Right? So we don't even think of, we talked about, we don't think about winning and losing. We think about, do you get to move your mission and purpose forward? And do I get to move my mission and purpose forward? And that's it. There is no competition. I don't have to win. And the only way for it is for you to lose. That said, tomorrow, we're supposed to have a conversation, you and me, about uh, the, the, some of those uh, terminology, uh, which I like of your Venn diagram. And I think you and I have the same idea of uh, when, you, when you mention win-win, it's, an, it's a heuristic of what, what Dan and I talk about, mutually beneficial agreements that moves 
our respective mission and purpose forward. But not everybody have that same idea. Absolutely. But again, I think that and a lot of that has been built out of a commercial culture that is being driven by the wrong motives and the causes. Uh, I'm on a mission at the moment um, because what I'm very, very conscious of is that you cannot change the behavior of the people in your organization until you change the thinking and culture of the leadership. And that is being driven by short-termism, by investors, by publicly listed companies being driven by the stock market. And the people who suffer from that inevitably are customers. But in between, what you find is your employees suffer from it as well because they feel that pressure. They, they are, uh, we see in sales the rise in mental health problems. We see burnout at the sales level and middle management level um, because of this inordinate pressure to behave in a way that is counter to people's values. Because we are a social species. We like helping others from within our tribe. And our customers should be part of our tribe. They're not the enemy. And Absolutely. what's really interesting, I'm having conversations with a handful of really forward-thinking procurement uh, specialists who look to the long term. They want to create partnerships with their suppliers. And it doesn't make sense for them to constantly beat up their suppliers because the supplier will try and find a way to get even or cut corners. And so, again, depending on the type of purchase, if it's got low financial impact and low supplier risk, then it's a commodity and both sides know where they are. But the problem is that if you don't understand why a purchasing person is buying that product or service, and you don't understand what they're trying to achieve in on behalf of the business and the line of business managers and this uh, executive, then chances are you will miss the big picture. And this is where most salespeople and tactical procurement people get it so wrong because they're only thinking about this short-term battle and they're not thinking about the war that you could be winning as allies uh, against the problems that they're facing. So you said something that is so, this is, the last couple of minutes is just so key. I would summarize it. We're just, we're just trying to build organizations that are essentially good people. Yeah. It's good people. You want them to be good people, to care about who they're serving. The problem is, uh, you've probably seen it, is sometimes companies want that, and it's multifaceted. It's many different areas, right? So you have organizations that believe in it, but then because their hiring process is broken, they bring in salespeople that don't embrace that idea, and then they ruin the reputation of the company. I couldn't agree with you more. I, one of the things that we're going to be working on within the community this year is what does good really look like? Because what has passed for good in sales for so long has been this alpha, uh, I win, you lose, hyper-competitive, they're not collaborators. What COVID has brought into really sharp focus is the imperative of becoming more collaborative. I look at the growth of the channel in the last 12 months, and the channel has thrived. In fact, one of the reasons why the economy has still kept turning is that the channel has stepped up to the plate. And because they have developed long-term relationships uh, with their vendors, with their customers, they've been able to solve problems, whereas the vendor organizations are so often driven by this short-term objective, which is to scale and grow at any cost, acquire as many new logos as possible, no matter what price you sell at, grow without profit and grow without strong fundamentals and um, then work towards a rapid exit. And that is being driven by the venture capital and to some extent the private equity community and by the markets. That I think is something that we have to stand against. We have to fix that. And the, I think the brighter investors will realize that their aims will be met 
if only they build strong businesses that make a profit, that have strong fundamentals, that have highly engaged employees, that have customers who stay for life and are loyal and love working with you, and you co-develop solutions to help them solve their problems so you stay relevant. I can listen to this all day long, Marcus. You know that because you talk. If we're talking uh, of uh, organizations as individuals, then we're trying to build healthy organizations as in healthy individuals, right? Yeah. And it's healthy mindset, healthy behaviors, things that is uh, focused on long-term, long-term thinking, long-term behavior, long-term agreements that doesn't fall apart easily. Short-term thinking, it's going to have turnover, you're going to have resentment, you're going to have a lot of uh, internal conflict and uh, short-term gains. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. It would win short term, but they will fall apart. Companies will fall apart very quickly. Other negative is that it's given rise to the psychopaths and sociopaths uh, to become leaders within businesses. And that, again, is incredibly dangerous. So if you've not read it, Snakes in Suits by Bob Hare and Robert Bibiak talks about how... Oh, my, death you purchase row, list. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, on death row, 3% of the prison population are psychopathic. In the uh, US boardroom, 5%. The idea that they have a home there and uh, it's the, the best place for them to go is terrifying. And you can see the, the fallout because businesses that are not set up to serve their customers serve their people, serve their community, then wreak massive destruction. And we're seeing this uh, in, you know, in the uh, levels of pollution. We're seeing this in the levels of abuse of workers' rights. We're seeing it with um, Ponzi schemes. Humanity has a, a habit of going rogue and going bad. And uh, part of the problem, I think, is the ability to fall into a mania you know, I've been uh, reading about um, the South Sea bubble and the Mississippi collapse and you know, the tulip bubble and so on. What's really fascinating is just how easily diverted we are as a species. It seems to be down to a large extent to forgetting our core values. I don't want to sound like I'm being preachy, I probably do, but values really are important. I tell organizations that a lot of organizations I go into, and you you probably see this, is they have values. But then when you ask the employees, so what are your, your company's uh, uh, core values? And they may be able to say one or one, maybe a Mac two. But if they have five or seven, you can forget it. They've already forgotten it. They don't know it. But if the values were important, the question is, do they hire based on those values? And do they Absolutely. fire based on those values? Are they that important, right? And that's how you can judge whether, in fact, those values are what the companies embrace or it just sounded good to their customers. And again, values are not something you pay lip service to. They're things that you live by and you do when no one is looking. And if you don't recruit for values and you don't make decisions through your value filter and you don't fire on the basis of breaking those values, then they're not really values. They're just lip service and something you paint on the wall for cosmetic effect. Well, I see sometimes companies violate their own values because of fear or desperation or neediness. Yeah. They may have a salesperson that is supposedly a rainmaker, but this person is abusive to the customers and the suppliers or even their internal team. And even though they have maybe respect on, on as a value, they are allowed to behave that way because of the short-term gain. Yeah. And that's a mistake. I couldn't agree more. If anyone wants a really fabulous example of sales leadership operating with genuine application of those values, read The Success Cadence by Tom Shodoff and Bart Finelli and Dave Matson. And the first chapter is all about how they decided on what the values were and they fired the top two sales performers within the business and performance just rocketed as soon as those two people left. Yeah. Alan, thank you so much. Same here. Thank Mark, you. It's always fun uh, uh, chatting with you on your podcast. Excellent. How can people get hold of you? Well, the best way is just to connect with me on LinkedIn, send me an invite, 
And um, if you have interest in what Dan and I do, just uh, hit us up and, and let's chat. Excellent. Alan Sang, thank you. Have a, have a great day, Marcus. So if you're the owner or CEO of a tech company in the 10 to 50 million mark, and your goal is to grow your business, achieve genuine and sustainable hypergrowth without the wings and wheels falling off. You want highly engaged salespeople, marketing people, customer success folk, and account growth teams that are really plugged into what your customers need and want. And you've got customers who stay with you for year after year after year. Then let's schedule a brief time for a conversation. My email is marcus at laughs-last.com or direct message me on LinkedIn. And if the topics that we've touched on today around raising the bar uh, within sales are of interest, look up sales a force for good, hashtag S-A-F-F-G, or hashtag sales a force for good. We're running a number of events on Clubhouse, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. We're looking for volunteers to have their voice and to discuss some of these really difficult, challenging issues and to raise the bar. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.